What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, my name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup. If that sounds like a good time, you'd be right. We do have fun around here. So if you'd like to be part of that fun every week, then make sure you subscribe to the channel before you leave today. We're actually creeping towards 2,500 subscribers, which I guess kind of means that we're on the road to 3,000 subscribers, which is completely inconceivable to me. I can still vividly remember hitting 50 subscribers and thinking that was like a crazy number. And now I'm sitting here talking about 3,000 subscribers. I truly cannot thank you guys enough for subscribing to the channel, liking the videos, chatting with me down in the comments. This channel has already grown into something so much more than I could have ever imagined. And honestly, it makes me emotional to think of like where it could end up someday. And that is quite literally all thanks to you guys. So thank you all so much. And you mean more to me than I could ever say. However, if you're not a fan of true crime, I'm intermingled with other genres, then feel free to see yourself out. There is plenty of internet out there for everyone, so surely you can find something else out there that's more your style. If by chance you happen to be super interested in this particular story, but you don't really love the makeup aspect, feel free to disregard the video portion and just listen to the audio as if it's a podcast, or if that doesn't work for you, you can skit scat skadoodle doot on down to the description box where I always make sure to list some more traditional true crime creators as well as some other media resources who have covered today's story in a way that I assume is more suited to your liking. Not that I think you're going to need my help in the least to find coverage on this story because it is everywhere. This is hands down 100% without a doubt the most mainstream current like densely covered case that I think I've ever featured. I will still have some other coverage linked down below though, so fear not. And with all of that said and done, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so like I said, I know that this case has been covered a lot. And I know it's not typically my style to cover cases that are super current or super widely covered, but I, I just can't shake this one. I saw the body cam footage on TikTok, like right when it was released. And when I saw it, I thought, wow, I should look into this. But um, then somewhere just out of nowhere, I didn't. That is until a little while later when I started seeing videos pop up left, right, and center all over YouTube with screenshots from said body cam footage as their thumbnails. And when I saw those, I was like, oh, yeah. And I'm not gonna lie, I was actually really annoyed with myself that I had forgotten about it and that I didn't look into it sooner because now I'm worried that no one's really gonna care to listen to me cover it. But I don't know, I still wanna talk about it because I've been looking into it so much and I have a lot of thoughts and I have a lot of opinions that frankly, I think my husband is tired of hearing. So I figured I would come on here anyway and share the information with you guys because you're my internet besties and this is quite literally how this channel came to be. So why not honor that? Today, we're going to be discussing the very infamous case of Alexi Treviso. Quick disclaimer before I begin, even though I assume that most of you at the very least are familiar with the main points of this case, but just in case there's anyone out there that's not, I do wanna put a warning at the beginning of the video that today's case is going to talk about the death of an infant as well as touch on miscarriage, abortion, and just general reproductive rights. So if that's triggering to you, then bye. Otherwise, for those of you sticking around, let's take it back to November 25th, 2003, when Alexi Joy Treviso was born. Alexi was born in Seminole, Texas to her mother Rosa and her biological father Guadalupe. She was the couple's third child, having had an older son as well as an older daughter before Alexi. Now, straight from the beginning of our story today, um, things in the Treviso family allegedly were not the best. Rosa has claimed very publicly that Guadalupe, who goes by Lupe, physically abused her during her pregnancy with Alexi. She also alleges that these beatings led to long lasting physical ailments for Alexi, things like chronic back pain. And while there's no way for me to personally confirm or refute the validity of these allegations, I do know for sure that fairly early on in Alexi's life, Rosa and Lupe did separate. Now, whether that is in relation to her allegations against Lupe or related to something totally different, 
I have no idea. All I know is that they separated and shortly after Rosa packed up the kids and the four of them moved about 100 miles west to Artesia, New Mexico in 2013. From that point on, I am not exactly sure what Rosa and Lupe's custody agreement was with their children. I'm inclined to believe, based on some photos that are on Lupe's Facebook, that he did remain in their lives, at least to some degree, for a while. That said, he does still live in Texas, so I have no idea how frequently he was able to see them. I don't know how long he was an active presence in their lives. For all I know, he's still an active presence in their lives. I just don't have a lot of concrete answers surrounding that. This case was actually pretty frustrating to research because of that, because it's hard to find a lot of the answers to questions that have come up about Alexi and about her family dynamic ever since her alleged crimes came to light. I promise you I'm doing my best here to create as clear of a picture as I can. I always think it's important to know the background of the people that we discuss here each week, but given that this case is so new in the grand scheme of true crime, those answers and specific details regarding the family are fairly difficult to come by. I do know that both Lupe and Rosa went on to remarry. It looks like Lupe went on to have a few more children with his new wife. And then from what I could gather, Rosa and her new husband, Ricardo Rodriguez, I don't think that they ever had any children together, but they did combine his children from his previous relationship together with Rosa's children, thus creating a cute, like little blended Brady Bunch style family vibe. And then within that family vibe, Rosa and Alexi were particularly close. They were always together. Rosa always made sure that she was present at any of Alexi's extracurriculars. They were so close that some people even thought that they were too close, like almost maybe codependent. I've heard people describe Rosa as sort of a helicopter mom, sort of controlling over Alexi and where she went and what she did. Even though she was 19 years old, she was well past being a legal adult, but that does not seem to matter to Rosa. Instead, she seems very much like a, if you're gonna live under my roof, you're gonna abide by my rules type of parent. And I can understand that to a certain degree, but I'll let you decide what kind of role you think that dynamic played in the way this whole story ends up playing out. For now though, all things considered, Alexi and her family seem to be just living your average run-of-the-mill middle-class life. Artesia is a small city in Eddy County, New Mexico. It spans over just under 11 and a half square miles, and it hosts a population of right around 12,000 people. From what I could gather, it seems like a fairly religious area, predominantly Christian. I think that I heard that there's somewhere like more than one church per square mile. So it's a very traditional value kind of place. It's also like a big sports town, high school sports. It's one of those places that holds its varsity athletes on a very high pedestal. At the time our story takes place, Alexi was a senior at Artesia High School. Go Bulldogs. She was a member of the school's choir. She was a cheerleader and she was in a long-term relationship with her boyfriend, Devin Fierro. Basically, she was living the quintessential stereotypical almost like movie-like high school experience. She was pretty, she was popular. She was the cheerleader dating the football player. She was in honors classes. She had a 3.8 GPA. She was all set to start college at New Mexico State University this fall. I don't think that anyone would have believed that rather than walking across the stage at her high school graduation back in June, that Alexi would instead be staring down the barrel of a first degree murder charge. It's honestly pretty difficult to wrap your head around the fact that we're even sitting here talking about her today. Talking about this 19 year old girl who to hear her described just seems so completely normal. From her brown hair and brown eyes to her textbook cookie cutter high school experience, nothing about Alexi would have made any of us stop and think that someday we'd be listening to her story on my channel. Sure, she was a little bit older than some of her classmates, but that was just because she had a late birthday and also at her mother's behest, she was forced to repeat second grade. But beyond that, nothing about this girl seemed out of the ordinary in the least. That is until late 2022, when rumors started rumoring around Artesia High School that Alexi might 
be pregnant. Alexi's friends did ask her about this. They asked her if she was pregnant, but each and every time the topic got brought up, Alexi vehemently denied it. She swore up and down, left and right, backwards and forwards that she was not pregnant. And instead she told her friends that maybe she was just putting on a little bit of weight because of her birth control pills. This became such a hot topic of discussion that Alexi actually started accusing people of bullying her or body shaming her due to her weight gain. And because of this, over the next few weeks, people just sort of dropped the whole thing. At least they did to her face. The conversation behind her back, however, well, that kept right on going. It kept on going and it actually only ended up getting worse towards the very end of 2022 and the very beginning of 2023 when Alexi started dressing in like progressively baggier clothing. This really fueled her classmates' suspicions. But no matter what, no matter how much weight she put on, no matter who asked her about it, didn't matter, Alexi was steadfast in her denial. She actually even ended up telling some of her close friends that she was planning on going on a diet to address her recent weight gain. And I think it was towards the mid to end of December that she started telling people that. And Alexi would lose the weight. In fact, she would lose it very quickly. However, diet and exercise would not be how she managed to resurrect her slim figure. January 26th, 2023 started out like pretty much any other average day did for Alexi and her family. It was a Thursday, so I assume she went to school, then she went to cheer practice, and then she came home for the evening. She was a little tired and a little sore following her cheer practice, so she did decide to turn in early for the evening, but other than that, nothing unusual. However, shortly after she did go to bed, Alexi woke up in excruciating pain. Based on what I know, I have to assume that she was feeling some abdominal pain, but from my understanding, most of the pain that she was feeling was located in her lower back. I did mention earlier that Alexi supposedly suffered from chronic back pain due to issues from Rose's pregnancy with her. However, this pain, I guess, was significantly worse than anything Alexi was used to. Around 11.30, the pain ended up getting so unbearable that Alexi actually woke up her mom and asked her to take her to the hospital. Rosa and Alexi arrived at Artesia General Hospital right around midnight which technically would have been the very early morning of Friday, February 27th. Alexi was ultimately admitted to the hospital for her severe back pain because after being triaged, the doctors were concerned that she might either be suffering from a lower urinary tract infection or potentially even something more serious, like either a kidney stone or maybe even a full-blown kidney infection. So she was admitted and the staff began a routine workup hoping to quickly determine the cause and treat the cause of Alexi's pain. She presented with a slightly elevated heart rate and when asked to rate her pain, she rated it as a 10 out of 10 on a pain scale. Something that immediately struck the hospital staff as odd though, was that Alexi refused to allow anyone to examine her beyond that point, beyond either visually or beyond taking her vitals. Basically, she did not want anyone touching her. She was treated with a few medications to help ease her symptoms. I believe she was given morphine for her pain, Zofran for nausea, and she was given sodium chloride, which I assume was for dehydration, considering the fact that she'd spent hours being physically active at cheer practice the previous afternoon. And then on top of that, doctors also asked Alexi if she was pregnant or if there was a chance that she she could be pregnant. And this is a very routine question. If you're a woman, a young lady, or a human with a uterus, and you go to the emergency room, or to any doctor for that matter, as sure as they're going to ask you for your name and date of birth, they're going to ask you if you're pregnant, if there's a chance you could be pregnant, or if you're nursing. And then depending on why you're there, they may also administer a pregnancy test because as in tune as I'm sure we all like to believe that we are with these meat sacks we walk around in all day, sometimes gauging the possibility of pregnancy based on someone's supposed last period is not reliable. Maybe their cycles are irregular, maybe they can't remember, maybe they'll lie about it. You know, you just can't always be sure. Now, you're not always gonna get pregnancy tested in the ER. Like I said, it's highly dependent on the symptoms you're experiencing that brought you there, and if said symptoms could in some way 
be related to pregnancy. Like I didn't have to take a pregnancy test when I went to the ER for my Quasimodo face last month, but that's because unless the baby was growing out of my face, I think they could tell that my issues were not pregnancy related. They did ask me if I was pregnant though. And they ask and sometimes they test for pregnancy because there are procedures and medications that are contraindicated for pregnancy, like x-rays, for example. And since Alexi was there for back and abdominal pain, which could obviously hold pregnancy implications, Ultimately, they did end up administering a urine test to Alexi. Now, I have no idea if they administered this test before or after she received all of the medications. I'm not sure if they had the results back before or after they administered them. I don't know. I've listened to the interviews and the statements of multiple different members of the hospital staff that were there that night, but there seems to be some sort of a disconnect between when exactly she was told that her pregnancy test had come back positive. With that said though, given what I've seen via the interviews and body cam footage from the hospital staff, I desperately want to believe that they did everything by the book because they all seem like incredible people who truly care about their patients and who take their jobs very, very seriously. Even directly reading Alexi's medical records, which I was able to find, I still can't really determine what order these events took place in. I do wanna mention though, that from the moment Alexi arrived at the hospital and they asked her if she could be pregnant to the moment those test results came back and even well after, Alexi was still adamant that she was not pregnant, nor had she ever been sexually active. Even when the urine test came back as positive, she still swore up and down that something had to be wrong because she absolutely unequivocally could not be pregnant. In fact, she even went on to tell some of the hospital staff that she was currently on her period. I do wanna point out here though, that even though a urine test is not as precise as a quantitative blood test, I'm pretty sure that if you get a false result from a urine pregnancy test, it is much more likely that you're going to get a false negative from testing too early than it is that you're going to get a false positive. Again, I'm sure false positives can happen. Actually, I know that there are some medical conditions. I think it might be certain types of cancers that will cause a urine pregnancy test to yield a false positive result. But in a healthy young teenager, I'm going to guess that false positive pregnancy tests are rare. Nevertheless though, Alexi maintained that she was a virgin and that because of that, there was just absolutely no way that she could truly be pregnant. <laughs> and as assured as Alexi was that she wasn't pregnant, Rosa was thrice that. She is very clearly, in my opinion, one of those parents that preaches abstinence because you know, we all know how effective that is. The hospital staff was even talking amongst themselves pretty much right from the start about how uncomfortable the dynamic between Alexi and Rosa was making them all. Rosa was clearly enraged at the idea of Alexi being pregnant. And in their opinion, Alexi seemed nervous and scared of the idea of upsetting her mom. Bottom line though, they needed to know what was going on, whether Rosa was gonna like it or not. So to definitively answer the question once and for all, hospital staff ordered a quantitative HCG test. In other words, they ordered a blood test to measure the specific level of HCG in Alexi's blood. This test helps to give doctors a much more precise reading on the gestation of a pregnancy. So it was going to help them determine approximately how far along Alexi might be. They also requested an emergency ultrasound because given the amount of pain, Alexi seemed to present with and her positive urine test, the hospital staff started to worry that she could have an ectopic pregnancy, which is when a fertilized egg grows outside of the uterus, typically in a fallopian tube. And if that was the cause of her pain, it was incredibly time sensitive because if a tube ruptures, it can lead to massive bleeding and it can be life-threatening. So at this point, they're waiting on an ultrasound technician to get to the hospital. It's not a typical service that they need in the ER overnight. So they don't have a sonographer on the overnight staff. So they're waiting on that as well as they're waiting on Alexi's blood test. However, before the results or the sonographer arrived at around 1.40 in the morning, Alexi told her mom, as well as some of the hospital staff, that she needed to poop, like, emergently. She can actually be seen on hospital surveillance, running to the bathroom and holding herself. And if you've ever had a baby, you know damn good and well what it means when all of a sudden you have to poop. When I was in labor with my first, that was exactly what I told one of my nurses when I was crowning. I'd had an epidural because 
baby. And I asked the nurse if she could help me to the bathroom because I had to poop. And she told me she would help me, but that she wanted to check my progress first. And sure enough, she was like, oh, honey, you don't need to poop. It's time to meet your baby. But considering the fact that Alexi wasn't pregnant, hospital staff did not examine her before allowing her to shuffle off to the restroom. And the last thing that I want to do when covering this case is criticize anything about how the hospital staff handled the situation that night. They've been through enough, but I will say that this is probably one of the only places that I wish they would have done something differently. Obviously, hindsight's 2020, but I just wish they would have thought, like, here we have this girl presenting with severe back and abdominal pain. She just tested positive for pregnancy, and now, like that, she has to poop so bad that she has to hold her butt while she's running to the bathroom. I really don't know what the right move would have been here. I don't know what they could have done differently. Obviously, she would have had to consent to a pelvic exam or to a cervical check, and likely she would not have done that with Rosa breathing down her neck. So short of having her poop in a bedpan in the room where they could watch her, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I just wish so badly that things would have played out differently. But alas... Here we are. Alexi runs to the restroom. She locks herself in. And just a few seconds later, Rosa can be seen on the same camera walking towards the bathroom to check on her. She knocks on the door, presumably to ask if everything's okay. And then it appears that she talks to Alexi through the door for a few more seconds before she walks away and heads back towards the hospital room. Alexi at no point opens the door and speaks face to face with her mom. Granted, if she was on the toilet mid bowel movement, obviously you wouldn't expect her to. I'm just explaining how everything went down. I believe after Rosa's first visit, Alexi was left alone in the bathroom uninterrupted for like 10 minutes before Rosa then returns, knocks again, and again, presumably asks her daughter if everything's okay. Again, I assume that Alexi told her she was fine. And again, Alexi does not open the door or attempt to speak face to face with her mother. Just like before, Rosa makes her way back to the hospital room. However, at this point, staff are starting to get concerned with what might be happening on the other side of that bathroom door. Eventually, the staff became so concerned that they started checking on her, knocking on the door, just as Rosa had, and asking her if she was okay and if she needed anything. She told them as well that she was fine, but they are concerned and suspicion continued to grow as they began to hear the toilet flush repeatedly, as well as the paper towel machine cycle repeatedly. From that point on, the staff pretty much stayed right outside the door. They continued to knock periodically and ask Alexi if she needed anything and if she was okay. But each and every time, Alexi's answer remained the same. She was fine and she did not need anything or anyone. I believe at one point she tried to tell them that she was just constipated and that that's what was taking so long. And they really did try to be respectful and they tried to give her her privacy, instructing her to press the call light in the bathroom if she needed anything. Remember that. Remember that they offered to come in and help her. They asked her multiple times if she needed anything and they asked her multiple times if she needed help and if she was okay. But she consistently and unwaveringly refuse that help. Alexi was in the bathroom for just under 20 minutes when hospital staff decided that they had had enough. They knocked on the door and they told Alexi that she either needed to unlock the door and come out or that they were going to unlock the door and come in. From my understanding, she either didn't respond to this right away or she told him to hold on or something along those lines. So true to his word, the nurse asked for the key so that he could unlock the bathroom door. It took a minute, but sure as shit, eventually you see the front desk clerk walking down the hall with the key to the bathroom. However, just as she passed the keys off, Alexi herself unlocked the door and finally emerged from the bathroom. She walked out cool as a cucumber and she walked past the hospital staff just the same as if all she truly had done within that bathroom was take a fat dump. But all it took was a brief glance into that bathroom by the hospital staff for them to know that something far more serious than a bowel movement had just taken place in there. There was blood smeared all over the bathroom. It was on the floor, it was on the toilet, it was on the wall. It was very clear that something about Alexi's bathroom trip was not right. Initially, the hospital staff actually thought that Alexi might have panicked when she heard the results of her pregnancy test and that 
Thereupon, she had done something to herself while in the bathroom to attempt to induce a miscarriage. Immediately, the staff approached Alexi and they asked her about the blood in the bathroom and stone-faced, serious as a heart attack, she tried to tell them that it was just blood from her period. What? I am 30 years old. I've been having periods for probably almost as long as this girl has been alive. And when I tell you that in all my years of menstruation, I have never, not once, ever gotten blood all over the bathroom while on my period. Not even when I was learning to use a menstrual cup. If you know, you know. The fact that she expected these trained medical professionals to believe that her period was the cause of the literal bloodbath that she left behind in that bathroom. There was so much blood left behind, even after she had clearly made an attempt to clean it up. There was so much blood that they said they could smell it from outside of the bathroom. The fuck kind of unearthly, like Stephen King-esque periods is she trying to pass off that she has? It should go without saying that they were absolutely not buying what she was selling. They were so skeptical of her story that one of the nurses actually ended up going into the bathroom and looking in the trash can to see if she left anything behind. But upon a cursory glance, it actually looked to him like the can was completely empty. He couldn't see any garbage and the can liner that was in the can appeared to be totally clean. I cannot even begin to imagine how confusing this whole situation must have been for these poor healthcare workers. As if these people haven't gone through it enough over the last few years. And now they got to do, let's just, let's stay on track. So they check the bathroom, they check the trash can. Initially it looks like there's nothing to see. So they call the housekeeping department so that they can get the bathroom cleaned up and safe for other patients to use again. They also had to clean up the hall because Alexi had left bloody footprints coming out of the bathroom as well. So. Obviously, there's a lot of biohazard going on. So the housekeeping employee comes up. She starts cleaning up the blood. She eventually moved the trash can. I don't know if she moved it to clean behind it or what, because according to the nurse who looked in it, it looked like it was empty. So I don't think that she would have moved it to change the bag. But regardless, for whatever reason, she did end up moving the trash can. And when she did, it caught her off guard because it felt unusually um, heavy. I assume given the fact that she thought it was empty, it wouldn't have taken much weight to throw her off, but nevertheless, the weight of the trash can gave her pause, enough to where she actually ended up calling over another employee, and together, the two of them began trying to figure out what was going on. Why was this apparently empty trash can so heavy? So they removed the top liner, the one that everyone thought looked empty, and beneath that, they found a bunch of like bunched up empty garbage bags. Like someone had taken a bunch off the roll and balled them up and then arranged them in like a solid layer underneath the top liner. So they pulled out all the empty bags and below that, tightly wrapped in yet another trash bag, that is where these two completely unsuspecting hospital employees discovered the lifeless body of a newborn baby boy. The baby was clearly visible in the bag as the plastic had quote, suctioned to his face. And when I say he was tightly wrapped, I mean he was tightly wrapped. The bag had been spun to prevent an opening, and then the excess bag had been wrapped and tucked up under the baby's body. I truly cannot even begin to fathom what a horrifying and devastating scene that was. To open this bag and see this tiny, cold, lifeless little baby. He was blue from a lack of oxygen and his umbilical stump was frayed. According to the staff, it looked like it had been torn apart or gnawed apart by an animal, which is just completely nauseating. And you can tell just based on the grainy, silent CCTV footage from the hospital that these employees are every bit as traumatized and horrified by this as you would expect them to be. I cannot even put into words how much respect I have for all healthcare workers, but most certainly for these people. The composure they maintained and the quick, decisive, purposeful action they took. I've witnessed a few medical emergencies firsthand before, obviously nothing compared to this, but when I tell you the way that my trauma response is to just completely freeze, I cannot imagine the level of shutdown that would have come over my body had I been in the position of these doctors and nurses. But they held it together. 
They kept their wits about them and they were able to put their emotions aside while they tried everything they possibly could to bring this poor, innocent, defenseless little baby back. However, unfortunately, despite their best efforts, too much time had elapsed between Alexi placing this baby boy in the garbage bag and the housekeeping personnel discovering him. There was just simply nothing that could be done. So at 2.28 a.m. on Friday, January 27th, 2023, this tiny little baby was officially declared deceased. He weighed five pounds, nine ounces. He was just under 19 inches long and he had a full head of thick, dark hair. Obviously, there was no way to be sure what had happened until an autopsy was performed, but just to look at him, he had no obvious signs of any medical issues or any physical trauma. And yet, here he lay in front of this group of medical professionals, a lifetime of experience between them all, yet none of them could comprehend what they had found themselves at the center of in that very moment. Meanwhile, back in Alexi's room, following delivering her baby and quite literally throwing him in the garbage, she underwent an abdominal ultrasound as well as a pelvic exam, all without a single word to hospital staff that, oh, BT dubs, I just had a literal fucking baby a few minutes ago. Alexi's pelvic exam revealed that not only was she heavily bleeding and passing what appeared to be tissue, but it also revealed that her cervix was wide open. And hearing that made me wonder, say they hadn't found the baby at this point, did she not think that these doctors and nurses would be able to tell just based off of ultrasounds and physical and pelvic exams that, by the way, now she was more than happy to submit to. You know, unlike when she first arrived at the hospital and she was still pregnant and she refused to let anyone touch her. Yeah, she was over that now, obviously. But did she truly think that they would not be able to tell just based on the state of her body that she had very, very recently given birth? Your uterus is like 500 times larger than it normally is following the birth of a full-term baby, and it's like 15 times heavier. You don't think they're gonna notice that on an ultrasound? It takes six weeks for that bad boy to shrink back down to normal size, not 35 steps from a bathroom to a hospital room. It also takes roughly six weeks for your cervix to slam back shut. Did she not think they were gonna notice that during her pelvic exam? Frankly, I am stupefied that she walked out of that bathroom thinking, problem solved. It serves as proof, in my opinion, just how little she truly understood about her own body. Once again, leading me to believe that she'd never learned anything sex ed wise past don't have sex. And that's not even like the part that gets me the most. Her lack of knowledge does not even hold a candle to the complete and total emotional disconnect that she seemed to have in relation to what she'd just done. That part of the story is nothing short of bone chilling and it will absolutely never not shock and disgust me to my very core. I just, Mm. Officers from Artesia Police Department arrived to Artesia General Hospital shortly after 2.30 a.m. Initially, they began speaking to the charge nurse that evening, which from my understanding is like the head nurse of a shift. Medical folks, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But they started out speaking to him. And while in the midst of kind of getting the rundown from him. One of the doctors, Dr. Vasquez, she came over and actually requested that one of the officers accompany her into Alexi's treatment room so that she could tell her and Rosa exactly what was going on. As if Alexi didn't already know. Well, I mean, I guess she didn't know that they'd found the baby, but she for damn sure knew she put him there. Regardless, like her or not, Alexi had just given birth and they did have a moral and ethical obligation to ensure that she was medically stable. Especially considering that no one had seen hide nor hair of her placenta, which if not delivered properly, can lead to a life-threatening infection or to postpartum hemorrhaging. So she needed proper post-delivery care. And actually in order to get said care, they were going to have to transfer her to a totally different facility. Artesia General didn't have an OBGYN or an obstetrics team to oversee Alexi's care. So prior to the cops even arriving at the hospital, the staff had already arranged for her to be transferred from AGH to Loveless Hospital in Roswell. There, she would have access to the type of care that she needed to ensure she was medically stable. However, before she could be transferred, she and her mother would have to be told why. But before we get into that, I'm going to take my break, throw on my lashes, and when we get back, hospital staff breaks the news to Alexi and Rosa. Don't go nowhere. 
Okay, so Dr. Vasquez, accompanied by one of the officers, makes her way back into Alexi's treatment room, where she informs she and Rosa that they had found a dead baby in the bathroom. Just matter-of-factly. Honestly, though, I don't really know how else there is to say that. Like, that's not really something that can be sugar-coated, nor should it, in my opinion. Alexi deserved to face exactly what she'd done. Rosa's immediate response is simply just, oh my god. And it kind of seems like it takes her a minute. Like, she doesn't really connect the dots right away. Like, she doesn't put two and two together that Alexi is the one who birthed the baby. Instead, it almost kind of sounds like she just heard some miscellaneous piece of like tawdry hospital gossip. It's not until Alexi begins trying to explain herself that the gravity of the situation seems to plow through Rosa's brain. And as soon as she does realize exactly what is going on, she turns to Alexi and she says, Alexi, I told you about this. I just asked you to tell me the truth, which is definitely an interesting response, but put a pin at that because we're gonna get into my opinion and such a little later. But for now, Alexi appears to be crying in response to her mother's obvious disapproval. She asserts that she had no idea that she was pregnant, that the baby just came out of her and that she didn't know what to do. And if it's not been made painfully clear up to this point, Alexi was so disconnected from her baby boy that she never once referred to him as he when she was speaking to her mother, to police, or to the hospital staff. She only ever refers to him as it or as nothing. She only says things like it just came out of me or nothing wasn't crying. Rosa then demanded to know exactly what happened. She paced around for a second and then she looked at Alexi and she said, what did you do to it? Again, just like her daughter, only referring to this poor baby as it. So at this point, things are clearly escalating between Rosa and Alexi. So Dr. Vasquez steps in and she tells them that they just need to stop. They need to stop right now because at this point, the most important thing is making sure that Alexi is treated for her postpartum bleeding. They have to make sure that she's not in any immediate medical danger, again, whether they like her or not, as doctors and healthcare professionals, they still have to prioritize her well-being. So Dr. Vasquez explains to Alexi that she'll need to be transferred to a different facility. She'd already arranged for her to be life-flighted out of Artesia General and admitted to Loveless Hospital, which is about 40 miles north of Artesia in Roswell. What's crazy about this exchange, though, is that given the dynamic between Rosa and Alexi, Dr. Vasquez almost seems to forget that Alexi is technically a legal adult. She actually asks Rosa for her permission to have Alexi transferred, at which point one of the nurses has to step in and remind Dr. Vasquez, like, she's 19, basically saying, we don't need her permission, we need the patients, we need Alexi's. And in my opinion, this seems to kind of annoy Rosa, like having to acknowledge that she's not technically in control of what happens to her daughter. She even tries to clap back at the nurse about how, well, even though she's 19, she's still a student. As if that means literally anything. As if somehow that's gonna put the ball back in Rosa's court. But obviously it doesn't. So once Dr. Vasquez has Alexi's permission to complete the transfer, she leaves the room, she goes out, and she begins to organize like the logistics of it. And this, I believe is like the only time that anyone shows so much as an ounce of, I don't really want to call it concern, but I guess I'll say curiosity. This is the only time I feel like we see anyone, save for maybe Alexi's stepdad, show any curiosity regarding anything that has to do with the baby. And that is when Rosa asks the nurse how big the baby was, to which he responds that it appeared to be full term. And I will say that I do think this genuinely shocked Rosa. There is a lot of speculation surrounding what Rosa did or didn't know. And I don't know that we'll ever fully and honestly know. But I do genuinely believe that the fact that Alexi had walked into that hospital 38 weeks pregnant truly did blindside her. The look of surprise on her face that you can see in the body cam footage, to me, seems authentic. That said, the look is fleeting though, because almost as quickly as it came, it is replaced by fear and anger as Rosa turns to her daughter and says, quote, Lexi, have you watched the news? These girls, what they do to their babies, and then they go to jail. To which Alexi responds, yet again, nothing was crying or 
it wasn't crying or one of the two very detached arguments she always seems to revert back to. It's like she's desperate to get even just one person to be like, oh, oh, it wasn't crying? Oh my, okay, that makes total sense. That's why you wrapped up your newborn baby boy in a plastic bag and threw him away like a piece of trash. We misunderstood. You're not in trouble. <laughs> Fucking Delululand, USA, population this broad. Well, population she and her mother, because Rosa, at one point, asks Alexi if she wants to get in trouble because she can get in trouble now for this. Hello? Do you not see the wall of cops surrounding you? Ma'am, that ship has sailed. She's already in trouble. It's as if Rosa had spent her entire life shielding Alexi from any real world, like outside consequences. So if in fact Alexi did what she's being accused of, if she did murder her newborn baby in the bathroom, is that maybe why she did it? Has she been so sheltered from consequences all her life that being in trouble with her mom at the time was the worst situation she could have possibly imagined? Obviously, I can't speak to what Alexi's home life was, but I think it's safe to say that based on the body cam footage, some of which we haven't even gotten into yet, it is fairly obvious, in my opinion, that Rosa is maybe just little overbearing. So was she so overbearing? Was she such a control freak that as a result, Alexi ended up with such a catastrophic deficiency in life skills? Because throughout her life, Rosa never equipped her with any. She has just none whatsoever. Is that why she can't seem to grasp the severity of what she's done? Is she too immature, too emotionally stunted? So she just can't understand the consequences. Again, these aren't even necessarily my theories. They're just like my general wonderings. At any rate though, Alexi was loaded into the helicopter to be life flighted from Artesia General to Loveless at 4.32 AM on January 27th. She was actually transported alone because prior to her transfer, police had removed Rosa from Alexi's room and they barred her from speaking to her until detectives said it was okay. And honestly, it's about damn time. I personally believe that Rosa should have been removed from Alexi's room a lot sooner. I think the dynamic between she and Alexi was clearly not conducive to a productive healthcare experience. And I'm within my right to hypothesize that the outcome of this story would have been different had Rosa not been there. Just like the hospital would have been well within their right to boot Rosa out of that room at any time. Hospitals can legally restrict visitation hours. They can limit the number of visitors a patient has, or they can deny family access to a patient based on safety concerns. So from my understanding, if the dynamic between Rosa and Alexi was impeding Alexi getting adequate healthcare or impeding her from being honest and transparent with her medical team, the hospital staff could have asked Rosa to bounce. And like I said, I think there's a chance that this whole thing would have played out differently if they had. Now that doesn't even begin to excuse whatever happened in that bathroom, not by a long shot. But does it maybe sort of begin to explain it? To clarify though, as far as not removing Rosa from Alexi's room, please do not misconstrue that as any attempt from me to place blame or fault of any kind on anyone that was there that night other than Alexi and maybe in a roundabout way, Rosa. Obviously, it's incredibly easy to look back in hindsight and to see things that are obviously red flags now, but in the moment, they might not have brought about as much wariness. The only thing that anyone should be saying in regards to the hospital staff is singing their praises. Not only did they professionally and respectfully and empathetically handle this whole fucking mess, but it's not like the hospital shut down for them to handle this. It's not like they even really got a minute to process what they'd all just gone through. Throughout this whole nightmare, they still had incoming emergencies to handle. They still had to go on and treat other patients as if nothing remarkable had happened there that evening. The first time I watched the body cam footage, I don't know why, but I was like taken aback watching one of the CNAs that had discovered the baby with Leela, the housekeeping employee. She was talking to police and in the middle of her conversation, she just had to answer the phone and carry on with her duties like normal. 
all while carrying this huge emotional weight on her. And I know that seems like such a mundane thing, but I don't know, it was just admirable the way they were all able to just continue doing their jobs so stoically in the wake of everything that was going on. They truly are heroes and they deserve nothing but empathy and respect for what they went through and for how they handled this situation. Even as word spread through the hospital and new players got thrown into the mix, as far as I am aware, everyone treated Alexi with respect and with dignity, well beyond what I would have been able to provide her with. Even listening to, in my opinion, a very clearly bullshit story about how her baby fell out in the toilet and never took a breath, they didn't scoff at her, they didn't roll their eyes, nothing. They simply just listened. And you know what? Same with the police that were there that night and the investigators that interviewed the hospital staff later. They showed so much kindness and compassion to each and every member of Artesia General that was there the night that Alexi was. It goes without saying that this story is horrific, but seeing these people come together and support one another did at least put a small break of light in the depressing abyss that was researching this case. Anyways, as Alexi was being loaded into the helicopter, one of the officers went into the Artesia General waiting room and spoke to her family. It was Rosa, Rosa's husband, so Alexi's stepdad, Devin, the baby's father slash Alexi's boyfriend, and Devin's mom, Melanie. And truly, if I could sum up, in my opinion, the tone of the room, uh, I think I would choose apathy, at least as far as the baby was concerned. The cop walked into the waiting room and he was immediately accosted by Rosa, asking about Alexi, what's gonna happen with her? Is she gonna go to jail? Is she being arrested? Just blah, 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 blah. And well, sure, as a parent, I can guarantee that I would have the same questions, but it just seems to me like every time the cop mentions the baby, Rosa bypasses anything that has to do with him and she somehow circles back to Alexi. Even when the officer mentions that the baby was a boy, I think he says something along the lines of, we'll have to send him off for autopsy. And no one even bats an eyelash. No one was like, oh my God, he was a boy. Devin wasn't like, oh my God, I had a son. Just nothing. Christ, the only person that seems to show even a shred of emotion or distress is Alexi's stepdad. And he's the only one that's not biologically related to the kid, which is why I will always die on the hill that biology does not necessarily make a family or a parent, or in this case, a grandparent. That said, don't you dare let Rosa hear you refer to her as a grandparent. She seemed very taken aback and very offended at the idea of being a grandparent. When the officer in the waiting room tried to clarify her relationship to the baby, he asked her, you'd be grandma. And she snapped back with a quickness that, uh, no, she was mom. She was Alexi's mom. Yes, but you're also a grandmother now, you know of that baby who's dead now that you're casually pretending does not exist. And the cop basically says just that, maybe not in so many words, rather he said, so you'd be the decedent's grandmother? To which Rose is like, oh, well, yeah. And this has definitely been a heavily scrutinized topic within this case. I mean, every inch of this case has been picked apart down to the molecular level, but I do agree that this does seem to be very telling as to Rosa's attitude around Alexi being sexually active and having been pregnant. It's very much giving, I'm too young to be a grandmother type energy. Hi, uh, newsflash, Rosa. Um, according to Planned Parenthood, most teens start having sex around 17. And given that Alexi was 19 and Devin was 18, it was more likely than not that they were bumping uglies. And since they have opposing biological parts, it's actually perfectly possible for her to be a grandmother, you know, biologically speaking. But she was not having it. And she also <laughs> was not going down solo. She was very quick to pull the classic, if I'm going down, I'm taking you with me. Making damn sure that the officer knew that if she was a grandma, so was Melanie because Melanie's Devin's mom and Devin's Alexi's boyfriend, therefore the father of the baby. <laughs> and y'all, when this officer clarifies with Devin that, is it true like you'd most likely be the father? Rosa laughs and she almost like answers for him as if to say that there is no way that her daughter could have possibly been having sex with more than one person. And I'm not saying she was, but 
ma'am, three hours ago, you acted like you'd put your life on the line and about that she wasn't sexually active at all. So maybe read the room. Take a beat and let the kid answer for himself. Not to mention that the idea of someone laughing in the situation they're in, in the first place, uh, gives me the willies. Now, despite the officer's initial estimate that the autopsy would only take a few days, it doesn't look like the official report was actually completed and signed off on until March 28th. I'd have to imagine that the autopsy was done well before that because it's my understanding that the baby's remains were returned to the family and cremated sometime in February. Regardless though, the autopsy was performed by Dr. Lauren Decker. Dr. Decker is a medical investigator and an assistant professor of pathology. She has degrees in molecular and cellular biology, chemistry and psychology, as well as her doctor of medicine degree. Dr. Decker specializes in forensic pathology and advanced postmortem imaging. Following her examination of Alexi's baby, Dr. Decker concluded that he had no anatomic abnormalities nor obvious physical injuries. She concluded that the baby's adrenal glands showed microscopic hemorrhaging, which can be seen in hypoxia or lack of air. She also reported that the baby's postmortem toxicology screening showed phentermine and morphine in his system. We know that morphine was given to Alexi in the hospital for her pain. However, the phentermine, which is a prescription appetite suppressant, well, it's speculated that that was a result of Alexi potentially taking diet pills as a way to combat her obvious pregnancy weight gain, which begs the question, how was Alexi getting a hold of that medication, considering it's not available over the counter, but I digress. Beyond that, Dr. Decker did ultimately determine that there was air in the baby's lungs and in his stomach, which is indicative of him being born alive. And as a result of these findings, Dr. Decker determined that the baby's cause of death was entrapment or death due to confinement in an enclosed space, basically suffocation, and she ruled his manner of death as a homicide. Now, personally, I've always believed that the baby was born alive, but knowing that he had air in his lungs, I don't care what Alexi tries to say or what she tries to claim as her defense in court. In my opinion, that baby was born alive and she killed that baby. I don't even think that it is possible for a stillborn baby to have air in their lungs. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. But Mama Dr. Jones taught me that while in utero, blood is oxygenated via the placenta and it bypasses the lungs. And then once a baby takes their first breath, uh, basically a switch in pressure changes their entire circulatory system. So personally, I would take it to mean that the air in the lungs would mean that the baby took at least one breath. Not to mention that the hospital staff described the bag as being suctioned to the baby's face, which leads me to believe that that poor little baby was gasping for air in that bag. Now, I do believe that the baby wasn't crying. That much I'll buy. My question though is, why wasn't it crying? Was it not crying because it just takes some babies a little bit to cry? Or were that poor baby's cries being purposefully stifled so as not to alert the medical staff as to what was happening in that bathroom? Because my guess is if they could hear the paper towel dispenser, they would have certainly heard a baby cry. But crying or not, that baby took a breath. That baby could have survived. That baby was put into that bag alive and suffocated to death in that bag. It may have taken two months, but that has been concretely determined. All this while Alexi was discharged from Loveless Hospital, allowed to return home, and allowed to return to school. She was allowed to attend Artesia High School's prom, and she received her diploma in June, just like the rest of her peers. Although she was asked not to walk at the graduation ceremony. According to her lawyer, she was asked very nicely not to attend because they, quote, take seriously the protection of their students. Actually, they take protecting their students so seriously that the superintendent of the Artesia Public School System sent out a letter to faculty and students regarding Alexi's situation. He doesn't mention her by name, but it is very obvious what he's talking about, in my opinion. And this email has been heavily scrutinized by those who've read it. It's been interpreted as almost a way to silence the students, almost as a way of forbidding them to talk about it. Now, I've heard that this was potentially even under the threat of suspension. However, it does not specifically say that in the email. So I don't know if that was true, if it was for sure that intense, but the email that was sent to students does read as follows. Good afternoon, Bulldogs. 
I want to remind everyone that the manner in which we choose to utilize social media is important. Social media should be utilized to celebrate accomplishments and to build each other up. It should highlight the best things about our lives. Social media should not be used to speak about subjects of which we know nothing about. When we do this, we are simply spreading untruths, which are also known as rumors. We need to communicate love, encouragement, and support for one another. Let's choose our words in a positive way. Thank you, Thad Phipps, Superintendent, Artesia Public Schools. To me, this very much reads as a please don't talk about this on social media because it kind of really doesn't look that great for us. But obviously, that's just my own personal interpretation. And as far as the email to the teachers, that read as follows. Good afternoon, APS employees. I want to make sure that everyone in our school district fully understands that as employees of Artesia Public Schools, we are prohibited by FERPA from disclosing personal information about our students to anyone other than their own legal parent or guardian. As an employee of the Artesia Public Schools, we are unable to discuss personal student matters in any setting. This includes in school, out of school, over weekends, through verbal communication, via electronic communication, etc. If anyone other than a child's legal parent or guardian asks you a question, your answer must be that you cannot discuss personal student matters and that you have no comment. Anyone asking questions regarding personal student matters should be referred directly to me. If anyone has any questions regarding the importance, blah, 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 you get it. Basically, don't talk about this or you're going to be in big trouble. At least that's how I'm reading it. And while I can appreciate teachers being prohibited from commenting to the media, I do think that it's bullshit to tell these kids that they can't discuss what happened. This shit was likely pretty traumatic for them, especially for those that were friends with Alexi and Devin. Ain't a snowball's chance in hell you're gonna keep them from talking about it, nor should you. They should be allowed to process their emotions and their reactions in whatever way feels comfortable and healing to them. I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it. Maybe I'm being too nitpicky. I just personally feel like they should have been proactive in this situation rather than reactive like they're being. Maybe they should have pulled Alexi aside when she was clearly and visibly pregnant and they should have talked to her, helped her, made sure she knew her options. But instead, it seems like they just turned a blind eye to it until it blew up and then they were like, oh, um, yeah, mum's the word, y'all. And then they tried to pretend like it just never happened, going so far as to let her hit the dance floor at prom, even though she's nationally suspected of murdering her baby. She's still just invited to come and dance the night away. Here she is, smiling from ear to ear. Hashtag prom. Should just blows my mind. Alexi was finally arrested though on May 10th, 2023. As you'd likely expect, Rosa did not take this well. Truly, the fact that she didn't get arrested for obstruction of justice, in my opinion, just goes to show you how incredibly kind and patient these cops were. She damn near barricaded the door to her home and told officers that she was not going to allow Alexi to come out until they told her what she was being arrested for. As if one, she didn't know, and two, as if Alexi ain't a damn adult. They don't answer to her. But as always, Rosa tries so incredibly hard to maintain control of the situation. Quite frankly though, let's call a spade a spade. This situation has gotten so far out of her control that any attempt to rein it in, in my opinion, is completely futile. Bless her heart though, she, she does try. She gets so bent out of shape that she ends up telling the cops that when all is said and done, she's coming for them and for the hospital. Yeah, she's effectively threatening to sue these cops who, they, they're just there executing a lawful arrest warrant. Jesus, they moved the car closer to her house so that Alexi doesn't have to walk that far before she's arrested. Is this lady okay? She truly seems to think that she is going to sue her daughter's way out of this or threaten her daughter's way out of this or find some legal loophole that she can snake her way through to make this all go away. If it's not evident through this exchange, it certainly was three days after Alexi gave birth when Rosa went to the Artesia Police Department and started just 
popping off at the mouth about how the hospital violated HIPAA and all sorts of stuff. She was really making way for what I believe Alexi's defense is going to be, which is either hospital negligence, medical malpractice, something along those lines. I think somehow they are for sure going to try and shift the blame for what happened that night off of Alexi and on to the hospital staff. You know, the same hospital staff that cried in their interviews with police, the hospital staff that were devastated that they didn't get a chance to save Alexi's baby, the hospital staff that stood outside the bathroom door as she gave birth in secret and repeatedly asked her if she needed help. That hospital staff, yeah, her lawyer has already basically all but said that that's gonna be his strategy. Before I get into that though, let me finish up with Alexi's arrest or I'm gonna get so jumbled up and twisted around in this absolute mess of a story that I'm just never gonna find my way back. So she was arrested on May 10th. She was booked into custody and she was formally charged with first degree murder, intentional abuse of a child resulting in death and tampering with evidence. The child abuse charge would eventually be dropped though. Alexi spent, I believe it was six days in jail before she was released on a $100,000 bond. However, when she was released, it was with barely any restrictions. She was still allowed to attend her classes in person. She was still allowed to graduate. She does have a curfew. I believe it's 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., but she doesn't have to wear an ankle monitor. She's not on house arrest. It is just crazy that for the next like two and a half months still, she'll just be living her life like nothing happened. I mean, she got that privilege for five months overall from May to October. October is when her trial is set to begin. But as of right now, she's got like half that left with just no consequences. Oh, she is required to attend counseling, but that's pretty much the only caveat to her being let out. There's a pre-trial hearing scheduled on September 11th before her actual trial is set to begin on October 2nd. Alexi is being represented by attorney Gary Mitchell. And like I stated before, based on the public statement that Mr. Mitchell made regarding this case, it definitely seems to me like they're going to try and blame all of this on the hospital. In his statement, Gerber stated that he has serious problems with the hospital care. He then goes on to, in my opinion, allude to the fact that the hospital is to blame for Alexi's baby's death due to the medication she was administered while in the emergency room prior to giving birth. And while yes, Alexi was administered medications in the emergency room, some of which can potentially cause issues in pregnancy, are we truly gonna sit here and pretend that she didn't swear up and down, not only that she was not pregnant, but that she wasn't even sexually active? And then we wanna fault the staff for believing her? There's only so much they can do with the information they're given. And honestly, from what I could find while researching, it doesn't even seem like any of the medications she was giving would have been likely to have caused that baby's death. I think morphine is the one that makes most people clutch their pearls when they hear it, but from what I could find, morphine is most dangerous to fetal development and well-being in the first trimester. And if given at the end of pregnancy, there is a slight risk that your baby will experience withdrawal symptoms when they're born, but in my research for this particular topic, morphine and pregnancy, which was admittedly fairly shallow, but I couldn't find anything that would indicate that one dose of morphine at 38 weeks pregnant would cause spontaneous infant death. Being tied in a trash bag can though. Oh, but according to Gary, if we knew what had truly happened in that bathroom, we would be pleased because Alexi did right by her baby. We would be pleased with what she did in that bathroom. We'd be pleased that she seemingly ran around the room like a rabid animal, smearing blood all over the place as she tried to conceal the fact that she'd given birth, that she'd allegedly ripped her baby's umbilical cord from the placenta before she threw him in the trash. Is this man okay? Regardless, Gerber has said that he does not believe that Alexi deserves to be prosecuted. He does not believe that she's guilty of first degree murder and he intends to defend her tenaciously. He maintains that she's innocent of the crimes New Mexico has accused her of. He asserts that she is an all around top notch student and person. And he thinks it's disgusting that she is even facing these charges because she is quote, a grieving mother. She just lost a child. And because she's being prosecuted and judged so harshly by we the public, he thinks that she is not being shown common human decency. Yes, he wants us to feel ashamed of ourselves for judging her. Truly, if the irony wasn't so disgusting and infuriating, 
it would almost be funny. She deserves common human decency. Did she show common human decency when she threw her baby boy in the garbage? But we're supposed to think it's all the hospital staff's fault. We're supposed to blame them. Is that common human decency? Trying to pass the blame for what happened to this poor, sweet, little innocent baby off onto the only people who truly seem to care about him? Have you no shame talking out your literal anus like this? It is crazy to me how entitled and selfish this argument makes her come across as. It makes it sound like she is the only one affected by what's going on. But sorry, newsflash Gare Bear, she is not the victim here. I know that she clearly didn't have the forethought to think of anyone other than herself, but this has implications in people's lives far beyond her little bubble. This even has further impact than the loss of that poor baby's life. The members of Alexi's care team at Artesia General, you know, the ones they're trying to blame, they and many of their colleagues will carry this experience with them for the rest of their lives. Many of them feeling immense guilt for not having found that sweet little boy sooner and for not getting a chance to save his life. And that is a weight and a guilt that they should under no circumstances have to carry around with them. The only person that should feel guilt in this scenario is Alexi. Stillborn or not, believe what you want, Either way, she still threw her own child in the garbage. No matter how many times I say it, I still cannot wrap my brain around it. Knowing from personal experience, the immediate comfort that can wash over a baby when it's placed in its mother's arms, to know that Alexi's baby never got to experience that, that instead he died alone and scared at the bottom of a trash can, it breaks my heart, obviously as a human, but especially as a mother. I also had my first baby when I was 19. I also had a baby boy. And absolutely, it was overwhelming and scary and incredibly difficult. I can absolutely empathize with those feelings. I was quite literally in the exact same position. Arguably, I was in a much less stable position than Alexi was, but that is a different story for a different day. Where we differ dramatically though, is that I can never, in my wildest imagination, envision a scenario in which that pregnancy ended with me hurting my baby. And you know what? That baby is 11 now. And when I tell you that he is just the coolest little dude and I cannot and would not want to imagine my life without him, he's quite literally my best friend. And to know that Alexi's baby is never going to get the chance to grow up or to be 11 or to have any kind of relationship with his mother is absolutely fucking gut-wrenching. I understand that legally she is innocent until proven guilty. I have to make that clear. However, if she is proven guilty, I hope that she is harshly punished. It just seems to me like she never had any intention of doing what was right by that little boy. She never attempted to receive any prenatal care. She took diet pills throughout her pregnancy. She made no attempts to pull anyone aside in the hospital to ask them for help. She's 19. If she was so goddamn scared of her mom, her mom didn't have to know anything. She had more options available to her than most people do. And at every single turn, she made the wrong choice. I know what I'm about to say is going to ruffle some feathers, but it's the reality of the situation. Alexi lives in New Mexico, one of the states with the most abundant abortion opportunities in the whole country. There are no waiting periods, no required parental consent, no cutoff times. If she so badly didn't want a baby, why would she have not taken advantage of the fact that she lives in one of the few states in this country that still allows women a choice and still allows women their bodily autonomy? If you're religious and you think that my stance that abortion is healthcare and should be an option is egregious and that I'm going to hell, fine. But answer me this, where's Alexi going? Is what she did better? I certainly don't think so. I think no matter where you stand, religiously or politically, you cannot possibly argue that an abortion would not have been significantly more humane than allowing her son to suffocate cold, scared, and alone in a plastic bag. And don't, don't tell me she didn't know she was pregnant and that that's why she didn't take advantage of that option. I will never believe that. She knew she was sexually active. She knew people were gossiping that she might be pregnant. She knew she was gaining weight. You're telling me that with all of that going on, she never once took a pregnancy test, I don't buy that. Anyone with eyeballs in their face and a brain in their head could have seen that she was pregnant. 
Are you kidding? And you know what? On the off chance that she didn't ever take a pregnancy test, in my opinion, that was out of sheer denial. If she didn't take one, it's because she already knew what it would say and she didn't want to face it, allegedly, in my opinion. And again, for argument's sake, say she really didn't know. She was in a fucking hospital surrounded by doctors and surrounded by nurses, all of whom were constantly knocking on that bathroom door and checking on her. If she was genuinely surprised by the birth of her baby, if he truly fell out in the toilet and truly wasn't crying, pull the fucking call cord, crack the door, ask for help. Artesia General is a safe haven facility. Open the door, tell them you don't want the baby and that you don't want your mom to know. Walk out the door and then never look back. It honestly and truly could have been that simple. There is no excuse in the world for thinking that the appropriate thing to do in that situation was to bundle a human baby up in a trash bag and throw him away. So in my opinion, at the very least, she should see consequences for that. Realistically, I think she deserves far more than that would bring because in my opinion, she knew what she did was wrong. That's why she didn't tell anybody. That's why she tried to clean up the evidence before she left the bathroom. And that's why she continuously denied help from the hospital staff. I think she genuinely believed she could throw her baby away and lie her way out of it, walking away scot-free. People who don't know that they did something wrong don't try to conceal what they did. I think she knew every bit how vile and revolting, deplorable and reprehensible what she did was. And every time I see her referred to as that baby's mother, it makes me want to vomit. And the fact that her family has the audacity to have a shadow box shrine in their living room, as if they ever showed one real iota of concern for that baby. Ugh. And the fact that she was allowed to bond out and continue living her life as if nothing happened. The fact that right now, while I'm filming this, right now while you're watching this, and for months to come, she's still just going to be out doing her thing, living her life. And personally, I think that has the potential to set a really bad precedence going forward. That she did this, that she at the very least threw her baby in a garbage can and then months later was smiling ear to ear at her prom, it, it makes me physically ill. Oh, and I've seen some speculation that the necklace she's wearing in her prom photo is an urn necklace. And I've also heard that Devin allegedly wears one as well. Look, I don't know what in the pretrial show these people are trying to prove here, but I know I've mentioned it a few times, but it's pretty obvious, in my opinion, the narrative they're trying to construct here. Right down to the wrongful death suit that they filed against Artesia General. Yeah, that's a thing that happened. She didn't care enough about her baby to alert medical staff to the fact that he even existed prior to wrapping him up in plastic and throwing him away, but she cares enough to sue the hospital in his name to make some money. What is the boiling point of brain? I'm sorry, but in my opinion, the shadow box, the urn necklaces, if that is in fact what they are, the wrongful death suit, it's all just coming across as incredibly performative to me. I had an early miscarriage in 2018 and I would be willing to bet good money that I took that harder than Alexi took the death of her baby. And I never even got to see that baby. I never got to hold that baby. I didn't get to grow that baby for 38 weeks. And I would still be willing to bet that I authentically grieved that baby more than Alexi's grieving right now. I'd be willing to bet that the only thing she's grieving is the potential loss of her future. All that whining and crying in the hospital, in my opinion, was out of self-preservation. It was all because her future was on the line, which coincidentally is likely why she didn't want her baby in the first place, because she didn't want to jeopardize her own future. And now her future is still unsure and she has to live with what she did and what she allegedly did for the rest of her life. And you know what? I'm sorry if it sounds mean, but I hope it eats her alive. Lifelong remorse is the absolute least she can give that poor little angel baby now. And with that, you guys, we are about wrapped for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. If in fact, Alexi did do what we all think that she did, why do you think she did it? Why do you think she hid her pregnancy as if there wasn't an inevitable and unavoidable impending consequence? Do you think she did it to protect Devin and his athletic career? We know the town's religious and we know they're absolutely feral for their sports. So with Devin being a highly ranked and highly regarded player in his sports, 
Was she afraid that having a baby out of wedlock would jeopardize his future? Is that why she initially declined to put him on the baby's birth and death certificate? I mean, I assume that she's ended up amending that decision because the baby does seem to legally have Devin's last name, but did she only change that once she realized how big this whole thing had become? Or did she do what she allegedly did for her own self-serving reasons to protect her own future so that she could run off to New Mexico State without the restraint and responsibility of a child. Did she allegedly do this in hopes of avoiding the wrath and consequences of her mother? Why didn't she get an abortion? Why didn't she turn the baby over to the hospital? Personally, I think she knew she was pregnant. I think maybe she thought that taking the diet pills would cause her to lose the pregnancy. I don't know if she knew she was in labor when she went to the hospital. Maybe that's why she asked her mom to come with her, even though she clearly didn't want her to know anything about the baby. I think at the absolute very least, Rosa had suspicions that Alexia was pregnant. I think that's why when she found out, her knee-jerk response was, we talked about this. I just asked you to tell me the truth. I do genuinely believe that Rosa did not realize quite how far along her daughter was, but no one can convince me that she didn't at least have a suspicion that Alexi was pregnant. I do think though that Alexi knew for whatever reason, that she wasn't gonna be pregnant for very much longer. I think maybe that's why she told her friends that she was gonna start dieting as a way to explain her soon to be sudden and very rapid weight loss. I don't know. I do know that I wanna see this girl's Google history. I want that because if she was Googling things like miscarriage, abortion, diet pills while pregnant, anything like that, I think that will obviously blast a pretty big hole in her, I didn't know I was pregnant argument. I don't know, I could theorize and speculate all day. Bottom line, there are still going to just be so many unanswered questions. And what's really sad is I don't know what could have been done in this particular situation to have resulted in a different outcome. This mother-daughter relationship just seems so very codependent. Rosa seems so controlling. The whole dynamic just seems fucked up. But overall, I do think that we need to destigmatize sex. We need to destigmatize talking about sex educating our kids about sex. We need to abandon abstinence-based sex ed in schools, and we need to instead teach kids how to be safe. We need to teach them what their options are if in fact they do find themselves in a situation like Lexi. We need to arm them preemptively with resources so they don't have to seek them out in a panic type situation. And finally, as parents, I think we need to make sure that our kids know that they can come to us with anything, that we're always in their corner and that no matter what, we're going to love them and support them and help them. Our children should not be scared of us, scared to come to us or scared to be honest with us because if they can't trust us, who can they trust? Anyways, as always, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts, theories, and opinions down below. Also, I would like to know if you guys want me to try and cover more of these current cases. I do have a hard time covering cases that are still unfolding because one, I have to say allegedly almost as much as a Chick-fil-A employee has to say my pleasure. And two, I personally prefer a story with a resolution, but if you guys like the coverage of these more current cases, I will definitely try to sprinkle more in. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you have a case or a topic you'd like to see me cover, please fill out the request submission form I have linked in the description box down below, which is also where you'll find all of the details and links for the products I used throughout today's video. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new videos every week, and if you turn on your post notifications, you'll be sure to catch me back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys. The toilet paper, toilet paper towel, wow. What the fuck is a toilet paper towel? Oh my god. Jesus Lord. Ugh, fuck you. Hello? We need hot general. Ow, I just poked myself right in the eye. Super. She has degrees in molecular and cellular biology. I have a degree in nothing.